point in time. So I'm going to turn it over to our project director, uh, Jessica Keller, and she's going to talk about both what we learned last year, what we're doing this year, and then I hope um, to not talk to you, but we're here to listen. So I hope that you all have a bunch of good questions and, and we can um, uh, answer some of the things that, that you uh, come here to learn this evening. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica. So, I'm going to talk about our 2015 field season and kind of review what we found, which is very exciting. But first, why we're here. Uh, there are a number of shipwrecks that happened around St. Croix, and as George Tyson has documented, over 114. But this project is specifically focusing on two, and these ships were carrying enslaved people from Africa. Um, the first one is called the Mary. Uh, it went down in 1797. It was an English ship, and it wrecked on the north side of Buck Island. The other vessel, which I think is more well known, is the General Abercrombie, which went down in 1803. It was also English built, and it also went down off of Buck Island. This aerial map kind of highlights why Buck Island was so treacherous, as you can see. I don't have a pointer, but the reefs are very extensive and the coral coverage uh, has been very great and very dangerous. Our archival research led us to this uh, 1798 Oxholm map. And the interesting thing, if we enlarge this image, is you can see that they have shaded in the areas of the treacherous reefs of Buck Island. So we have historically the island and its reefs and how you know it has tracked ships for a number of years. In May, we were here for two weeks conducting re remote sensing with a magnetometer. So we had a boat, and we were towing the magnetometer behind us looking for magnetic objects. So their signature uh, would be picked up on our tow fish behind us. And all these yellow lines, which I'm not sure if you guys in the back can see, but they're squiggle lines, and that is an individual line driven by the boat. So we did a lot of what we call mowing the yard back and forth, so we know these we know your reefs quite well and they are beautiful uh, but we were able to cover quite a bit in just two weeks and what we were able to find we had 168 magnetic anomalies so that's really good we had a lot of stuff uh, we were able to investigate a number of them and some of the objects that we turned up were a possible old shank long uh, an old long shanks admiralty anchor as you can see in this image here it has a ring and it's uh, bent. We also found a very interesting site, which had what we believe to be a, a carrying anchor in addition to a long shank admiralty anchor right together. Now, one anchor is older than the other. We don't know their association, but it is very interesting. And you can see the, the secondary anchor in the back. So this site is extremely phenomenal, and it's beautiful. We also were able to find a brick site so we accomplished all of these uh, investigations, both snorkeling and diving. Some of the sites are a little bit deeper, so we need diving to be able. Sure. sure. identified in red, these are bricks. And so we put little red dots on them and there's a scatter, but that's very exciting. Um, that tells us, you know, it can relate to the maritime landscape of the building of all these different th pieces and parts on the island. So that brings us to what we've done so far this year. We've been here for two days. We've had two days on the water. And we've been able to accomplish a lot of survey. Uh, we had some really good weather days, so we knocked a lot out, which brings our total surveyed area to this, as you can see. So we just have a little bit um, more of a section to do, and it happens to be around those treacherous reefs. So we're going to be very careful and proceed cautiously so we don't end up on the reef. But what we have been able to find so far, um, out of the 168 anomalies,
days. We have 42 left to jump as of yesterday. And some of the things that we found yesterday included these two anchors. We're not sure you know, their history just yet, but we're excited to do the research and documentation to find out more about them. And we also were able to find an additional section of that brick site. So before, the bricks were scattered in that one image, but as you can see here, I hope you can see, these bricks are actually kind of laid out side by side. So that's very exciting, and it's gonna help us as archeologists tell a story about this wrecking event, and hopefully about this ship, and how it relates to the island and your history. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. David Morgan. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. How's everybody doing? Good. Thank you very much for having us back again. This, for me personally, is just one of the most important things that I think I've ever done. I mean, this is one of the few projects that you can be involved with where it's it's more than just the artifacts. It's more than just the process. It's about who we are as people, how we identify how we handle our past, how we define ourselves going forward. And I'm really looking forward to talking with you a little bit more about that later in the evening. Right now we're doing sort of the, what we've done and looking at a lot of interesting things. And I think that's great. And I, and I think that what we want to be doing is talking about conversation about race, identity, history, and the future. Because these are all topics that are deeply deeply important to us. So thank you for letting us come and, and engage in that conversation with you because I think it is is one of the most meaningful things that we can do as people and as citizens together coming forward. So one of the things that's transpired, and this has been great good fortune for us since we had a chance to meet with you last year, is the National Park Service had funds appropriated for them to deal with civil rights and the legacy of the civil rights movement. And the Park Service has interpreted this very broadly, not just to be that pivotal period in the 1960s where we were emerging into what would become our, our new identity today, where we were looking at freedom and getting out from under oppression and, and being a more equal society as I think we all want to be. But we said, in order to really understand that, you have to look at things today. You have to look at things like Ferguson today and think about that. But you also have to understand that entire arc of equality, if you will, to paraphrase the man himself. If you can look at that entire arc from the legacy of slavery all the way to today. And that's been, that's been a fundamental and fundamentally important thing for the Park Service to be doing. We're taking steps to address some gaps in what we've interpreted and trying to fill those. And they're very difficult issues for everyone, but that doesn't mean that they're not Fact, it probably means they are the most important issues to tackle because of that. And so when the Park Service received this initiative and the funds that go with it to investigate civil rights, we said we need to also understand what the civil rights was founded on. Where did we get to that point in time and how did we get there? And so we're really appreciative because uh, we now are able to bring forward a project to look not just on the water, but to also look on the land. And this is, and Steve from last year can do such a much better job than me talking about this. I can only sort of try and do the best I can from the heart about how I feel about all of it. But it is a huge landscape, and it's not just a landscape here on St. Croix, but it's a Caribbean landscape, and it's a global landscape. It, the transatlantic slave trade is probably one of the most impactful population events to occur within human history. And it's really difficult to wrap your mind around that. So what we're trying to do with the project that's already been shaping up in South Africa is begin to look at the African side of that component. We're almost metaphorically kind of recapitulating the route of the triangle trade as we, as we look at this. And so as we've moved now into the Caribbean, it, this is our opportunity to highlight how that experience occurred here. What happened to people when literally they got off the boat? And in the case of these two particular shipwrecks, after they were stranded and had to survive to get off the boat. And what, was, what were people's fates after that? And how did they come to be there? And how did they handle that grueling, horrific experience along the way? 
And so we've gotten funding, and Dr. Hardy will tell you more about the actual project, but we've gotten funding to work on the remains of this structure as it looked like in its original uh, incarnation. So as you know, most of, most I'm sure everybody knows, the building that we're standing in, 18th century Danish building, designed to administer the colony and the commercialization of humans. That's what it was for. And this building used to run out further, of course, than it is today. And we know from other work that the park has done here, we know roughly where a lot of those structures were. There's been some archaeology that university colleagues outside of the Park Service have done. And this is an opportunity this year to begin to expand on that a little more. So without any further ado, because she knows the details far better than me, let me introduce Dr. Meredith Hardy. Um, so, like David said, we have received funding, we actually just got it two weeks ago, to, uh, to begin a community archaeology project here at, at the headquarters of Christiansted National Historic Site. Um, the purpose for the project is, it's, a, it's part, is a very big component of Slave Rex, which is to build local capacity, which is to bring in the community to actually work with us on these projects, not just to do archaeology, but to learn skills um, in cultural resource management. We're partnering with the University of Virgin Islands this year. We are bringing in uh, three interns from the University of Virgin Islands that I know of, and potentially one more, to, um, to begin introducing people, to begin to introduce the students to archaeological science and cultural resource management, which includes archives, records keeping, Collect, um, dealing with museum and artifacts, and going all the way to interpretation. And it also provides a venue for the, for the students to actually share their experiences in real time, using, utilizing social media and building exhibits themselves that help tell the stories about what it is that they found, what it means to them, and what it means for their families, for their friends, and, other, and all of their neighbors. The Park Service gets something here too. You know, we management agency, we gotta maintain our resources. We get baseline documentation. We're able to be better stewards of the resource and, and interpret them to uh, Prussians, Virgin Islanders, all the tourists that come here off of tour boats who they're only gonna see it for 10 minutes and then go on. Hopefully we can make an impact to them as well. So like I said, we are choosing three, uh, four student interns for the summer. Three we know are going to be from University of Virgin Islands. I'm interviewing them all next week in one day. It's going to be a crazy day. Um, the interns will work with archaeologists from our office, the Southeast Archaeological Center in Tallahassee, Florida, on uh, a field project that's going to be open to the public to come and join us on all aspects, on the excavations, on the cleaning the artifacts, on the analyzing the artifacts, entering it into databases, and then finally, the actual curation and helping the preparation into museum exhibits that will be, hopefully, fingers crossed, up for 2017 transfer. And featured in here was um, Park Service uh, intern and then volunteer and is one of our um, greeting youth uh, interns for the summer, Mr. Akeem McIntosh, who I believe is standing in the back of the room. He's been working with us. much with the park here, he's going to actually, hopefully, be serving as a mentoring role for the new interns coming in, showing them the ropes, getting them involved, trying to get them excited. So we're really looking forward to working with Akeem this summer. So very quick overview of the history of slavery here on St. Croix. It does not begin with the Danes. It goes back to English and French periods. You do begin to see enslaved Africans coming here in, as far back as the 1630s but you don't really see it until the French period beginning in the 1650s. Of course, when France leaves here in 1696, everybody goes away. But then it starts again when the Danes show up in 1733. And I think many of us know the history after that. So what we're looking at is the wharf area here in, in Christiansted um, and the changes to the landscape over time and how did the royal slaves, specifically 
who were living here and working here, what were their lives like? How did they experience, um, how did they experience day to day life here? So one of the first things we do at Arche as historical archaeologists is we look at historic maps and try to get the lay of the land, what's potentially underneath the ground. So we'll go back to the map, 1754. If you look at E, that's where we are right now. So here in 1754, across the street is a church, that's B. If you look up at G, F, and I, those are all weighing houses and pack houses. And if you look up at E, that's actually a blacksmith. In 1760, there hasn't been much change. 1779, this is the complex. Um, here's us. If you can see, it's now a walled structure. It's going across Hospital Street. And the circled area there is um, slave living quarters. It's stated as such on the map. 1786, not as much detail, but you can see how that complex relates to the rest of the wharf area. By 1803, Hospital Street is here. The complex has been cut in half. And again, the circled areas are different um, slave housing areas in the complex. So when you overlay them, you can see there's a lot of stuff that archeologically could be extremely confusing if you don't have all of this research under your belt. And here it is with the satellite views. You can see how we've overlaid the historic maps over the satellite views. It's all been georeferenced and it's in a geographic information system that we use to track um, all of the soils that are recovered, all of the artifacts. We can look at the distributions of all of the artifacts as we recover them during a project. And hopefully be able to tie them to specific buildings, certain places in time. So in December uh, 2015, SIAC, Southeast Archaeological Center, was here. We were here to do archaeology for the removal of the mahogany tree that was over at Steeple Building. Um, while we were here, we took the opportunity, because we had no idea if we were going to get the funding for this year's community archaeology program, we shipped down a ground penetrating radar unit. And we ran the radar all over the grounds here at the fort and the complex, just to try to go ahead and get a handle on what's here. So that's the area, those are the areas that we covered in December. It took us two weeks. Um, it's a lot of groundwork. And now some of this area, um, maybe some of y'all remember, 99, 2000, we had, a, um, we had other archaeologists down here doing very similar work. Today, the technology is much better. We can process the data much, you know, there have been great advances in the technology. We can really see what's underneath the soil instead of just lines and clips. So, when we start to process the data, we can go in different slices in time, the further down you go. So, 20 centimeters below the surface, all those red lines you see, utility lines. There's a lot of utility lines. It looks like somebody didn't want to fix the line, they just put in a different line. Or they didn't want to fix the plumbing, they just put in another line. It's, it looks like a bowl of spaghetti, of uncooked spaghetti out here. It's a mess. So when you clean it up, you begin to see a few patterns. So we see these straight lines, which are probably utilities. This is probably a um, sewer or manhole or something like that. You see a, things, a few things popping up here, and then you see something really big right here. At 35, it starts to clear up, and the utilities are going away, but some of those hot spots are still showing up. So they're, they're structured there. They're continuing further down into the soil. At 45, some of them are still sticking around, which means it's probably something substantial. And then at 52, you can see, here's that manhole cover again. You've got something going on here. You've got, looks like some structural thing here, and then you've got some structural thing going on here. When we start to overlay these with the historic maps, you see that the disturbances line up very nicely with some of the residential places here. You get lining up here with some of these historic buildings here. And a little bit lining up here on, looks like one potentially a fence or could, looks like you do see some kind of a structural running there. And you line up with 1803, you have similar 
this lines up very back wall. It looks like it lines up here. He's still you're still seeing some structure here. And you're still seeing something coming off of the back of Customs House, which is here. This could actually be from the earlier from the earlier occupation. So we plan on being here sometime around June and all through July. We will also be working with a University of Tulsa, Oklahoma. PhD candidate, um, Alicia Odawale. She was here last summer digging out there. Now she's a part of our group, and she's going to be down here working with us, and her professor will be here as well. Um, we're very happy to include her as part of our team. We, um, we're going to be working with her on the analysis and the interpretation of, um, of the, the remains of the complex here at the Guinea Company Warehouse. Now I'd like to pass the mic off to Jerry Good evening. Good evening. How are you all this evening? Okay, so I was very excited to come down to St. Croix, and I've been here since yesterday, and everyone's been most gracious. And so I have to thank the friends of the park for hosting this evening, and our friends at the National Park Service for hosting us for this visit. This is a really important time, and I need to extend greetings from Lonnie Bunch, our director. He was very regretful that he couldn't come down for this particular visit, but he's excited about what's taking place here at St. Croix. We have our Associate Director of Curatorial Affairs, Dr. Rex Ellis, who will be joining the group later this week, and we look forward to seeing some of the sites on the island and in the water. And speaking with community residents, and speaking of community, I'd like to just say community um, involves everybody, and so that's gonna be part of what I wanna share with you today. Community involves everybody. So I appreciate your discussion about race, and I know that was from the heart. And um, when we say community, we have to think about inclusivity. So this history that's been shown to you in the water, on the land, is being uncovered and discussed in the park service, in museum sites, in the classroom, and we are bringing this to the public because these are important discussions to have, and it's powerful to do it in the context of looking at this history through objects, through oral history, through genealogy. Everyone has a story to tell, right? I say that because I'm co-curating the um, Slavery and Freedom exhibit at the new National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it's been my pleasure to work with my colleague, Thank you. I, I, you know, it's funny, I told Dr. Chen, she was introducing me to everybody today, and I'm more of a behind the scenes person, and when she'd say the Smithsonian people would light up, I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just love what I do, and I love that I get to do it with folks like these guys here, including Dr. Chen and all my MPS, new family now. Um, but we're working on the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition, and the stories that will be told are American stories told through the African-American lens. But that lens saw other African-Americans, people of European descent, people of Native American descent, and so we talk about all of it. I'm gonna give you an example. In the section on the transatlantic slave trade, clearly we will be talking about the experience of people of African descent. We also include a book, it's called the Fox Wages Book. Some might say, well, why do you need that? It's a book, and I think I shared this with my colleagues, it's a book of, um, of wages that were paid out to the crew members on the slave ship. What does that tell us? You see names of people who had to make these choices, moral choices. Some people went because they needed to feed their families. Some people went because they wanted passage to the new world. Some people were involved strictly for profit, right? And so it gives you a fuller picture and it helps you think a little bit more deeply about this whole story. On the same note, we tell the story of people of African descent, African Americans. We worked with, we had the pleasure of working with some folks at the National Park Service site in Cane River, Louisiana. And we're going to feature the story of a gentleman named Solomon Williams. He was a blacksmith on a plantation in, at Oakland Plantation in Louisiana. Now, I spoke on Dr. Chen's radio show earlier today, and I shared the fact that oftentimes you hear slavery and you think of um, Johnny with a hoe. 
And so it's told in a way that here's a black man or a woman and they had a tool. And oftentimes when it's interpreted like that, the person becomes a tool. What we're doing is looking at the whole person, their whole life. We did it with Thomas Jefferson and he will be featured in this. We're doing this with African Americans and people of African descent. So let me tell you about Solomon Williams and how we're interpreting him. We look at African Americans like anyone else. They had families, they had faith systems, they had dreams and aspirations even under the most harshest conditions. So we look at him through three beats, life, work, and enslavement. Here's a man who had experience as a blacksmith, but he created an amazing double helix drill, drill bit, and it's perfect to the math the way it was designed, the engineering of this piece. It looks like artistry, right? Um, that was him using his skills, and he wasn't educated, and he was enslaved. He used those same skills to create the grave markers that are ornate, beautiful pieces of art that went on the grave sites of people in the community, including the grave marker wheel feature that was specifically placed on his wife's grave site. That is the story of life. So work was the drill bit. The artistry of the grave marker is life, but work, enslavement actually, how we feature that is we show an actual restraint, a shackle. And no doubt as the blacksmith on this plantation, he had to create those restraints. So that gives you a full picture of who this man is. So when you come into this museum, and we're looking forward to doing similar work here, that we will tell these stories. This is so very important. I know that there was a meeting before and I didn't get to be here, but we have to hear from the community because we can't, can't interpret all of this. We didn't live it. Truth be told, when we talk about memory, none of you all lived it either. But stories were passed down. There are artifacts out there. There are things that we can share together to bring this story to the fold so everyone can learn from it. Now, with regard to the Slave Rights Project, we use um, relationships with key partners. And our key partners for the piece for um, South Africa, which some of you saw in 60 Minutes, we were fortunate enough to work with, of course, our standard um, partners, our standing partners all the time, George Washington University and the National Park Service. And we are working with um, the Ezekiel Museum, which is like the Smithsonian in South Africa, and folks in Mozambique. And we looked at this slave ship, the Sao Jose, that started from Lisbon, went to, Mozambique, went to Mozambique and picked up captive Africans, and then, of course, crashed off the um, coast of South Africa. And of the 400 enslaved that were on board the ship, and I hope I get the numbers exactly right, I think half of them perished. So we talk about this story, and the other part about slavery and freedom, emphasis on slavery and freedom, is the story of survival, resistance, and resilience. This is a story clearly about the suffering and about people who endured this, this passage, this forced passage. But these stories still talk about survival, resistance, and resilience. We're fortunate to be able to feature the story of the Sao Jose in the inaugural exhibition on slavery and freedom. We have a special place for these artifacts. We call it a sacred space, and it's the story of the Middle Passage. What will happen is we will show these artifacts from these slave wrecks, and eventually they rotate out. So we have to identify another site, and the whole point is to draw together this diasporic story. So now we are really excited to be looking at St. Croix. And hopefully, we will find some really great stuff and be able to rotate those stories in so that the world can see the importance of this site on so many levels. Um, once we are done with these artifacts, we send them back to their original site so that communities around the world, or communities, period, in South Africa, the South African community will be able to look at those artifacts in a deeper level from a community perspective. The same thing here, you know? So, those are some of the things you should be aware of. I'm making my pitch because I hope to knock on some of your doors with Akim and Meredith and Dr. Chen, and I'm gonna drag in David and Dave, who insists that he's just an underwater guy. <laughs> and we're going to wanna talk and just say, you know, tell us your story because it's vastly important. 
The last thing I want to share is that um, while we can look around this room, and it's important that we talk very frankly, race is here. It is an issue that we don't talk about enough, and you can't get past it unless you talk about it, right? So when we look around the room, and National Park Service has done a fabulous job, the fact is that when you see folks, you don't always see people of color in these uniforms all the time. What's exciting about this is with UVI and with National Park Service, you just heard Meredith talk about the internship, we create opportunities. You have to train the next generation. Perhaps when job announcements go out, people may not even be aware of it or know. I didn't even know there were such opportunities. Well, now they're being created so that we can train the next generation to be able to interpret their story and to also contribute to the National Park Service here and in other places, right? So this is all very important and I want to thank you again. I'm looking forward to um, going around and seeing some of the sites on the island and in the water. I told them no pictures while we're in the water. <laughs> and um, I've had the pleasure of going around with Dr. Chen today. She's introduced me to some fabulous folks and so I want to pass the mic to her and thank you again so much for allowing us to come and speak today. So I'm going to do the part that we were talking about from last, last year in regard to talking about collaboration and why there are certain people that may not come into the space. Because it is a space that reminds people of a very painful time in history. And some people aren't comfortable doing that in the Caribbean, in the Americas, on the planet. So at some point, one of the things that is really important to do, and we've been working very hard within various programs at the University of the Virgin Islands, primarily because we are the only historically black college and university and land grant institution in the Caribbean. Because we have a predominantly African descent based population of students in our institution. Because we have a number of homegrown scholars that have not been properly injected and engaged in the University of the Virgin Islands for reasons that predate me. I, that was a joke, that was a joke. <laughs> I want to just highlight that what we're starting to do through the Caribbean Cultural Studies Program that has been re resurrected at the University of the Virgin Islands is to start to do some of these different types of courses whether they're through directed studies programs, whether they're through independent study programs. And I want to thank the person that tends to feel that I kind of put them under the bus a lot, and I want to take a moment and acknowledge the superintendent of the National Park Service. <laughs> and, uh, I told you I was going to make up for it. Remember what happened last year? So I'm cleaning it up. Because primarily because of some of the partnerships and collaborative arrangements that we've had through this formal memorandum of understanding with the National Park Service here, we've been able to partner and actually engage in this particular project, the African Slave Rights Project. We've been able to engage in this establishing an actual calendar, if you will. It's still in its draft mode because we're looking for more input in regards to St. Croix specific historic preservation, cultural heritage appropriate dates and information so that we can actually create those types of apps. So inside of our communications program, for example, like that's why you see me walking around with recording devices all the time. I have students that are, it isn't in the room, it's a joke, but they're just like <laughs> documenting what we're talking about and then they actually help to edit as part of their communication course study and they start to post them on SoundCloud, put things on Vimeo, get things on YouTube, add it to Twitter, even though I'm not the best Twitter person because that's just not enough characters for me to say what I want to say. <laughs> but, I, but I prefer Facebook and we're starting to do a couple of collaborative engagements that are very well supported through this very unique relationship that we have with the National Park Service. Persons that don't like UBI or don't like NPS or don't like this organization or that organization, what we're starting to do is to reach out to every organization whether, because it's not about liking everybody, but it's about respecting everyone's skill, talent, intellectual expertise, and the wisdom that comes with starting to tell our stories. 
and to start to restore how we engage with one another so that the next generation doesn't go through another hundred years of drama and chaos and miseducation. So we have an opportunity, while last year the Virgin Islands engaged in the Liberty Centennial, this year we're very proud to be a part of the National Park Service's Centennial activities because they do a lot of stuff. Everything's green, everything's bright, everything's fabulous. They find money for you. It's really great. It's like excellent. <laughs> and then the next year we get an opportunity. Exactly like my hair. And then next year we get an opportunity to really revisit how we observe because that term celebrate is a very, again, like this room. It's a very sensitive conversation. So persons, and I'm really encouraging all of us to revisit. It's an observance. It is a historic reality. There was a transfer, it was a purchase, and yes, next year marks that centennial piece. So we're very honored as well that because of what we're doing with the National Park Service, the University of Virgin Islands also has had an opportunity to expand with the Virgin Islands Centennial Commission. And I believe we already may have identified, I believe the Vice Chair, yes. Mr. Jamil Larson, I just want to acknowledge you because they have, again, you got to give them applause. applause because they provide resources. Now, we have a lecture series that we've been able to expand, and in that lecture series, we get to talk about the African Slave Rec Project. We get to talk about all these other partnerships with FISHCO, the Virgin Islands State Historic Preservation Office. We get to embrace some of the work that we're doing with Succeed. And even though people may not think that the water archaeological research has anything to do with the Maroon Sanctuary Park. It has a significant relationship because these persons that did run away, it wasn't like they went on, a, on land. They were in the sea and in all types of conditions. So there's another connection to that experience. So we do get an opportunity to work with Cushion Heritage and Nature Tourism, and I do see that the executive director came. I want to acknowledge Prandell Gerard. I want to make sure that <laughs> tenth generation Virgin Islander, correct? I just want to clean it up. Yeah, okay. I'm going to try to that false. And then I also have had the opportunity with this project to see that collaboration. You'll hear me say it a lot: collaboration, cohesiveness, cooperative agreements. Unity, okay, Emoja, I know it's a swingy word, but I like using it anyway. But that unity, collaboration, that becomes really critical because not everybody is gonna see interpretation the exact same way. That's why it's called interpretation, yeah? And we wanna start to be able to tell these truths through a variety of lenses. So like even the work we do with St. Croix Unified for community, culture, environment, and economic development. See, I'm getting better. Succeed, we have their president. Again, a strategic planner. Someone that's actually credentialed in planning, not just doing it for the sake of doing it, but actually credentialed in planning. You know, want to acknowledge all that young Hines, please. And I wanted to take some time with that, because I have a long list, but it's okay, I'll come back to that in my conversation. But I think it's really critical because our students are listening. As quiet as it may be said, they are listening. They may not always come out to these activities because they don't. They feel it's a bunch of old people in a room that's just talking nar and we just talk and talk and talk. And we don't have enough visuals, so they really like the PowerPoints. They like things that are done with Prezi. They love video. And the more that we engage like that, then this institution that is the only HBCU and LGI, our only higher education institution in the Virgin Islands, can be a resource, make our faculty, staff, and administration engage. It's not just, and I wanna make sure I highlight that, this is not the Dr. Chen show, but I appreciate that we make it seem like that because of all the colors I wear now, people are accustomed to me wearing all white, so I try to do a little different thing, I don't know if you noticed, but it's like, it's a humor, I'm working with this. But, I, but the idea is to be able to show persons how the National Park Service is centripetal to a lot of the successes of this particular work. To show also how we're starting to work with the Smithsonian Institution and the National Museum of African American History and Culture so that we ensure that there is some semblance of a thread of our narrative here in the Virgin Islands that is fully included in this American narrative. 
because it cannot be complete if the Virgin Islands, St. Croix, definitely the cultural capital of the Virgin Islands, is not included. And I know we're supposed to talk about it. I mean, and I'm sure that with all of the other threats, there's the St. Croix Landmark Society. We have a host of resources that Landmarks has in place. We've got the Visha work that Dr. George Tyson has been engaged in. And even though he gets really impassioned and make sure that we all remember this, like is it 1.9 million biographical data entries now? Yeah, see what I'm saying? Last time it was 1.7. So I'm just saying it's growing. So that all of this is part of what we're beginning to bring into what at the University of the Virgin Islands is established through the Virgin Islands Caribbean Culture Center. And I'm gonna close with that. You need to come and see what we're attempting to do in less than a thousand square feet with very small staff. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I'm very, 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 very pleased with this collaboration. So you keep hearing me talk about collaboration, cooperative agreements, cohesiveness, and unity. Because through that, and through some of the projects like Heritage Education and Arts Legacy, listen to the letters. Heritage Education and Arts Legacy. What is the acronym? HEAL. And that's what we're attempting to do. So it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of this project. And have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>